evening. I came down all the way from Canada, and this weather is actually quite warm, but you see I'm wearing a jacket here. But we're here giving you the good news of Jesus Christ. I want to start this evening by reading you a passage from Luke chapter, Luke chapter 16. We got some fans already here tonight. Luke chapter 16, starting at verse 19. This is the uh, story of the rich man and Lazarus. There was a rich man who was dressed in purple and fine linen and lived in luxury every day. At his gate was, a, was laid a beggar named Lazarus, covered with sores, and longed to eat what fell from the rich man's table. Even the dogs came and licked the sores. The time came when the beggar died, and the angels carried him to Abraham's side. The rich man also died and was buried. In Hades, where he was in torment, he looked up and saw Abraham far away with Lazarus by his side. So he called to him, Father Abraham, have pity on me, and send Lazarus to dip the tip of his finger in water and cool my tongue, because I am in agony in this fire. But Abraham replied, Son, remember that in your lifetime you received good things, while Lazarus received bad things. But now he is comforted here, and you are in agony. And besides all this, between us and you a great chasm has been set in place, so that those who want to go from here to you cannot, nor can anyone cross over from there to us. He answered, Can I beg you, Father, to send Lazarus to my family, for I have five brothers. Let him warn them, so that they will not also come to this place of torment. Abraham replied, They have Moses and the prophets. Let them listen to them. No, Father, Abraham said, but if someone from the dead goes to them, they will repent. He said to them, If they do not listen to Moses and the prophets, they will not be convinced, even if someone rises from the dead. Here ends the reading of God's word. That's quite incredible. Rich man and Lazarus. This man in Hades and hell was told that even if somebody came from the dead, they wouldn't believe. You know what the Bible says? That everybody believes in God. Everybody can hear my voice tonight believes in God. And we're all, we're all without excuse. You can't hear me? And we're all without excuse for our sin. See, Romans 3.23 it says, all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. All have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. Now the question that people ask is, what is sin? Get over yourself. What is sin and why, sir, do you want to talk or do you want to just walk by and, uh, and do your drive-by? I'd be happy to reason with you, sir. That's what we're here. That's what we're here for. What is sin? Why is sin sinful? Sin is a violation of the character of God. Now you're going to get people up here that are going to tell you that stealing is wrong. And it is wrong, but I'm not going to tell you that. You're going to get people up here to tell you today that adultery is wrong. Well, it is wrong. I'm not going to tell you that it's wrong. You're going to get people up here to tell you that they love sinning. But you know, people are going to say that stealing is wrong. And I'm not going to tell you that, but it is wrong. What I'm going to tell you today is why it's wrong. Now why is adultery wrong? Why is adultery wrong? Is adultery wrong because it destroys families? No. That's not why adultery is wrong. Is adultery wrong because it destroys marriages? No. It does destroy marriages, but that's not why adultery is wrong. Do you know why adultery is wrong, ma'am? Do you know why adultery is wrong? Adultery is wrong for one reason and one reason only. Because God is perfectly faithful. When we commit adultery, we lie about who God is. Ephesians 5 verse 1 says, Be ye imitators of God. When we commit adultery, we lie who God, about who God is. That's why adultery is wrong. Now why is stealing wrong? Stealing is not wrong because you make your neighbor mad because you stole a shovel. Stealing is not wrong because you make your boss mad because you stole a statement. Stealing is wrong for one reason and one reason only. Stealing is wrong because God is not a thief. When you steal, you lie about who God is. Why is lying wrong? Lying is wrong because you told your wife that you were somewhere where you weren't really there. Lying is not wrong because you make your, your neighbor mad because you said a, something untrue there. Lying is wrong for one reason and one reason only. Lying is wrong because God is perfectly honest. When you lie, you lie about who God is. That's why lying is wrong. And the problem is, every single one of us fails to live according to how we're supposed to live, according to the character of God. And that puts us in debt to God, to a righteous and holy God. 
So that even one sin demands an eternity in hell. Now people don't understand that. They say, how can a finite sin demand an eternity in hell? How can a finite sin demand an eternity in hell? And the people who ask that question, the reason they ask that question is because they don't understand how great God is. And I can explain this to you. Why a finite sin demands eternity in hell? Because it's about how great God is. Now, I'll give you an example. I have four brothers. Let's say I went home, and I took a swing at one of my brothers, and I missed. We'd laugh it off and be, you know, a big joke. But let's say I went home and I took a swing at my mother, and I missed. It'd be a little bit more serious. Now, let's say a policeman came by here, and he wanted to know what I was doing. I took a swing at him, and I missed. I'd probably go to court. I'd be standing in the courtroom. Let's say in the courtroom, I went up to the judge, and I took a swing at the judge, and I missed. I'm probably going to jail. Let's say the presidential motorcade was coming by here and I ran out of the crowd and tried to take a swing at the president. I could get shot or go to jail for the rest of my life. And I've done exactly the same thing. But why is my penalty more severe? Because of how great the person is who I do it against. And that's why finite sin demanded eternity in hell. Not because of the severity of our sin, but because of how great God is. See, I've got news for you folks. Sin is not a measurement of how bad you are. Sin is not a measurement of how bad you are. Sin is a measurement of how good you're not. You see, sin, the, tomb was, the term was also used in the Old England and archery. And it was used, if you missed the center of the target, it was called sin. If you missed it by an inch, it was called sin. If you missed it by a foot, it was called sin. If you missed it by a meter, it was called sin. If you shot the arrow in the opposite direction, it was called sin. See, missing the mark, that's what sin is. And all of us are guilty of that. Because none of us could live perfectly. And that has put us in a debt with God. A debt that none of us can pay. We cannot pay that debt for a perfect God. So what do you do? What do we do? We can't pay that debt. You have a question, sir? I'd be happy to address you. You have a question? Go ahead. You have a question, sir? Jesus is God in the flesh. Have you been drinking tonight, sir? No. You haven't? Do you have any other questions? Yes. What's, I think they're dead. Uh, Pardon me? I answered that question. What question? Sir, um, are you right no, with God? No, I said, who's Jesus? You lied. All right, have a good evening. Okay, so now here's the, here's the problem. That we have a debt that we cannot pay. So what do we do? See, I can't pay a debt against a perfect God. But God in His love sent his son to pay that debt for me. Now this is a question, because we got some Christians in our group here, and a lot of people don't understand the answer to this question. But here's the question I ask people. When you ask for forgiveness of your sins, do you ask for God's justice, or do you ask for his mercy? I won't ask for a show of hands because I don't want to embarrass anybody. But when I ask this question, I say, how many people ask for God's mercy when they ask for forgiveness of sins? And most people put up their hands. I say, how many people ask for justice? And very few people put up their hands. And I say, the reason I ask that question is that most people get it wrong. And you did. If you think that when we ask God for forgiveness of sins, we ask for His mercy. We actually ask for His justice. And I can explain that to you. Now let's say there's a coffee shop down the street here. And I walk into that coffee shop, and I don't have any money. And I go up to the counter, and there's somebody behind the counter, and I say, I look, I'd really like to have a coffee, but I don't have any money on me. What's the guy going to say? Look, we're in the business of selling coffee. We can't just give it away. Come on, you know, we can't just do that. Say, look, you throw away coffee when it's stale. Just one coffee. Please, just one coffee. You're going to say, okay, here. But don't bug me. He gives you a coffee. Now, let's say the next day you go into the same coffee shop. Same guy behind the counter. And you go up to the counter and you say, look, I'd like to have a coffee, but I don't have any money on me. What's the guy going to say? I gave you one yesterday. You say, yeah, you didn't go broke, did you? Come on, just one more coffee. He's going to say, here but don't come back. Let's say the next day you go to the same coffee shop, same guy behind the counter, you open the door, he says, you out. You know why? Because you're depending on his mercy. And his mercy has just run out. Now let's say a friend of yours goes into that coffee shop and says, here's a thousand dollars. This is for my friend's side. That's my name. He's coming in here every day. He's gonna want a coffee. This is for him. The next day you go into that same coffee shop, you open the door, same guy behind the counter, your head down, you go up to the counter and you say, look, I know you kicked me out of here yesterday, 
I'd really like to have a coffee, but I don't have any money. So what does the guy say? Would you like a donut with that? What's the difference? The difference is that there's cash in the till. And I'm here to tell you, gentlemen, tonight that the only cash in the till that can pay for our sins is the blood of Jesus Christ. That's the only way that our sins can be paid for. And that's justice. When we ask God, it says in, in 1 John 1 verse 9 that God is faithful and just and will forgive us our sins. We get the justice of Almighty God that our sins are paid for. But I know the question is, well, the Bible says that God is merciful too. Where's the mercy that is just justice? And let me finish my story. Let's say you walk out of that coffee shop and you get in your car and you start driving home and you get pulled over by a policeman for speeding. The policeman says, you are speeding. Your fine is $250. Now, he can treat you with justice or with mercy, but he can't do both. If he gives you justice, mercy is not served. If he gives you mercy, justice is not served. And this policeman has had a very bad day, so he gives you justice. And he says, your fine is $250. You say, I can't pay. He says, then you have to go in front of the judge. I guess I got to go in front of the judge. You're standing in front of that judge, and the judge says, you are guilty of speeding, your fine is $250, and you say, I can't pay. The judge says, then you have to go to jail. And I guess I'm going to jail. And just then a friend of yours walks into the courtroom and says, here's $250, this is for my friend Sai, I'm paying his fine. You get the mercy, you get the justice of that fellow that the fine is paid in full, and you get the mercy that he paid him. Now people are going to think that that's a Christian story, but that's not the Christian story. It's very similar to the Christian story, but there's one difference. I don't have a friend that can come into that courtroom. Nobody can pay the penalty of a righteous and holy judge of sin against him. See, this Christian story is that I'm standing in front of that judge and I cannot pay. And the judge stands up and he takes off his robe and he comes down and he pays the fine in my place. That's the Christian story. So we get the justice of an almighty judge that he came down and paid the fine. And we get the mercy in that he did it. Justice and mercy reconciled at the cross of Jesus Christ. You see, when I go to heaven, I get God's full justice in that Jesus paid my fine. And I get the mercy in that he did it. And if you people face God on judgment day without having your sins paid for, then you get his full justice without his mercy. And I don't want that for any of you here tonight. I don't want that for any of you here tonight, God's justice without his mercy. Now, folks, I'm going to leave you with one more story before friend of mine comes up here and takes over. It's a story about a homeless man standing on the side of the road. Now you go up to a homeless man and uh, he asks for money. You say, look, I'm not going to give you any money, sir. You're probably going to drink it or stick it in your arms or snort it. I'm not going to give you any, any money, sir. You say, but I tell you what I will do. I'll take you to that shop over there and you can take whatever you want and I'm going to pay for it. And you get near the guy and he stinks. He stinks like urine like body odor, like vomit. The guy hasn't had a shower in months. He stinks. How you doing, man? And you take him into that store. And you walk in that store, and the girl recognizes him as the homeless man that's been sitting out there. And she smells him, and she steps back. You're looking at the security camera, looking down, the guy's going down the aisle, picks up a loaf of bread. He picks up some milk. He's picking stuff up, and she knows he doesn't have any money. And he comes up, and he puts all this stuff on the counter. And she steps back from this stench. And she looks at him, and she looks at you, you say, yes, he's with me. And that fellow says, I'm with him. And he pays it for you. Now folks, I'm here to tell you that that story about that person who stinks when he stands in front of that clerk, it's not a very good representation, but you know who that person is on Judgment Day? That person is me. That person is Andrew. That person is all of us here. We stand in front of a righteous and holy judge and we stink from the filth of our sin, and we have nothing to pay. We have nothing to pay. The filth of our sin that has accumulated for our entire life, and we have nothing to pay. But we can turn to our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ, and say, I'm with Him. And He can say, yes, He's with me. And folks, that's the Christian story. That's the Christian message. And I urge you folks not to die in your sin, to stand in front of a righteous and holy God without having Jesus Christ there to say, yes, he's with me. And folks, that's what I hope and I pray for you tonight. Amen. That's what I hope and pray for you guys tonight. And that's why we're out here as a group to witness to you people. Because, you know, we know that all of us, even us here, 
are not representing God as we ought to the way we live our lives. But thankfully, God in His love sent His Son to pay that perfect sacrifice, a sacrifice that we could never pay. Folks, I urge you to uh, take heed to this message, and if it's pricked your hearts at all, take your Bible, read about it. And what I urge you to do, folks, is repent. Repent. Now the question is, what is repentance? See, now this woman here needs to repent. You need to repent. What is repentance? Now this woman needs to repent. Now what is repentance? Is repentance something you say, something you think, or something you do? See, a lot of people get this question wrong too. I ask Christians that is repentance something you say, something you think, or something you do? I get people telling me that repentance is something you do, and it's not. They say repentance is something you say, and it's not. Repentance comes from the Greek word metanoia, which means to change your mind. Repentance is something you think. Now the next question is, how do I repent? How do I repent? And I got some bad news for you. You can repent. Repentance is the gift of God. So that's what I urge you to do, to change your mind about God, and the way you do that is to get on your knees and to beg Him for repentance. Beg him to change your mind about who he is. And if he does that, it will change what you say. It will change what you do. See, you really, it was a trick question. It's all three. The word means to change your mind. But that will change what you say and change what you do. Then you love the thing that God loves and you hate the thing that he hates. And it's free. And that's what I wish for all of you who are hearing my voice tonight. There's no accident, sir, that you hear my voice tonight. No accident at all. <laughs> Not rock and roll, sir. We're urging you to repent and put your trust in Jesus Christ. Uh, thank you for your time this evening.